So overall, I know it's probably a pretty general question, but how would you describe your personal philosophy on hitting? Um, <laughs> there's a lot. There's, yeah, there's a lot behind that. Um, you know, I know I just have a brief experience at this level. Um, preparation is is key to everything up here, and, and I think generally, you know, I would try to drive everything off of getting guys as confident as possible. Guys are more confident when they're prepared. Um, they feel more prepared when things are simple. Um, so if we can get, you know, all the information we have and, and, you know, pair it all down to something really simple, the guys will walk into the box more confident because they feel more prepared for what they're going to see. And, and, you know, part of the daily process is preparing for what they're going to see as well. So they've, they practiced against it every, a little bit every day. Um, that also builds the confidence. So, yeah, I guess number one, man, this is a this is a game of confidence, a hundred percent. I mean, I was traveling around the minor leagues um, in the past year. I mean, you could tell the guys that were going to hit every day when I'd show up to a new city and a new affiliate. The guys that were walking around with more confidence were the guys that were hitting. And um, you know, there's not not a lot of easy ways to 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 build artificial confidence. So, you know, the best ways to do it is through preparation for me. So that that's kind of. Um, and it's not going into specifics on swing technique or anything like that, but that, that to me is the key at, at this level. <clears throat> um, Zach, after he made the move, talked a lot about how, you know, he just felt like the process, the word that you used as well, needed to get better at the big league level. Uh, I guess what, what are the types of processes that you are looking to implement and, and how challenging is that to kind of hit the ground running in that regard with a team that, you know, is, is in the middle of a season right now? Yeah, I would get it. It starts with the, the approach process, um, you know, game planning for that, that night's pitcher and the process all around that. Number one, it's about simplifying what those guys do for the guys that are about to step in the box against it to, to a really simple approach that can keep them committed to something that um, stays within their strengths and, and, you know, matches up with what the pitcher does well or what, what he, you know, where, where he gets hit. Um, it's a lot of individual nuance to that with pitcher types and, and our guys strengths and weaknesses but being able to really individualize that um and then prepare that each day is is an all-out assault against that that pitcher and and seeing some of what you're going to see that night in in their practice each day um you know building a day where you know you still want to do guys want to get their routines in and work on their stuff but building through the day um towards you know getting to that game mentality where you're committed to something again that that's simple and makes guys feel prepared and, and feels the confidence when they step in there. <clears throat> Thanks. Your next question is from Justin Toscano. Hey, Hugh, kind of similar to Steve. Zach was also talking about giving players better support. Uh, when you, you hear that term, what specific things are you going to do to help accomplish that at the big league level? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, it starts with that. I mean, I, it's, I know, I know the amount of effort it takes up here to give a full position player roster support. Um, it's constantly being on top of, you know, again, I, I, I got to get to know these guys better and, and know, you know, the words that, that link up with how they like to think about their swings and their approaches. And, um, you got to get them knowing better to know how their mental game works in general. So, you know, when they're distracted, um, when they're confident, um, so you can kind of play the mental, you know, keep them in a, in a good mental equilibrium there as well. But, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's getting to know them. It's, it's being on top of their swing so much that, you know, when something's deviating a little bit, um, knowing them all on an individual level that you can match up all the info you're, you're kind of parsing down from, from the pitchers to, to something that makes a lot of sense for them. So. Right, right. And then when they hired you here, what were you told about the specific vision for the hitting program that they wanted to implement organizationally? Yeah, um, that, that was the, you know, when I came over to the Mets, that was it, it was trying to kind of uh, reboot the infrastructure of the, of the minor league system and, and more than anything, just getting systems going. Um, you know, I think they were, they were starting to build some of that, um, you know, last couple of years. It's just about really fine tuning the systems that, that make it really clear for minor league players, what they're developing, what their goals are, how they're going to do it, what their daily process is going to be. I mean, that's process on a much grander scale, obviously, than the daily process in, in the major leagues, but um, 
that was it. Just and, and you know, between myself and Kevin, uh, you know, Jeremy Barnes, who's you know, the way his brain works is he's about as good at, at conceptualizing systems as anybody out there um, and, and making things really simple and easy to execute, but also, you know, practical and getting, you know, making sure we're accountable and getting the results we want. So that, that was the main plan for player development. Thank you. Your next question comes from Tony DeComo. Thank you. Um, hey, Tony. Not to compare you to, to past guys, it's not fair to you, it's not fair to them, but philosophically, a lot of the homegrown players on this team have come up through two different kind of hitting regimes. One was Chile, which was a more contact-based, all-fields approach. Before that, it was more pull the ball, launch angle. Those were the things that were preached a little more. I'm just curious where on that spectrum you lie. Yeah, great question. I It's kind of, I think... How I got into this game, you know, where if, when I when I started with the Mariners, what I think drew them to me is that I, I'm and I've learned this more and more as I've gone through it. Everything in this game is a happy medium for me on the on the hitting side of things. And even if it's you're, you're breaking down technique, I mean, on a really simple level, like you want to get some forward movement, but you don't want to jump forward. You want to stay back, but you don't want to hang back and do like just on that level. Everything's a happy medium, but then even on a bigger scale, the, the launch angle, elevate the ball movement to older school thoughts that were, you know, a little bit, a little bit different. It's a, it's a happy medium. There's certain guys that, um, you know, the way their bodies move, the way their swing works more, you know, more of a ground ball thought gets them the results that they want. I mean, at the end of the day, if, if the results are good, I, it doesn't really matter how a guy's getting there, what he's thinking, what is, what his thoughts or approach are. It's, it's getting the results they want. I, you know, I uh, had a unique history coming in. I, I worked when I was playing way back when in, in the minors, I worked with Walter Eniak. He was, he was from my hometown and he's about as, as old school as it gets. And Chile and I actually connected a lot on him. Chile knew him really well. Um, and I, I loved it. Like he was one of the best hitting coaches I had. Um, and he he's, would be considered, you know, in the hitting world, very opposite of some of the newer school thoughts, but I knew the value of a lot of the, the stuff that that worked for players that, that is in that older school realm. And I I've seen the value of some of the newer school stuff work for guys. So I, it's a blend. It's finding the right match for the right guy. Um, it all comes down to what, you know, what, what does a guy need to think to get productive results on a field? Um, if a guy needs to think ground balls, because that, that's what he gets in the most production on the field, then that's great. If a guy is get, hitting way too many of those or he's, chopping and popping all over the place and, and thinking about elevating gets him to move a little bit better and cleans up the path or results, then that might be the approach for him. But um, that, that, I guess that sums it up. And just in spring training, how much were you able to maybe get a little familiarity with some of these players? How much hands-on time, if at all, did you, did you kind of get with the guys you're going to be working with now? Yeah. I mean, not a ton under any sort of instructional microscope, just kind of getting to know guys. Um, mostly just, you know, spending a lot of time with, with Chili and, and Slate and um, they were, those guys were great, honestly. And there's, a, there's a reason why they had such an impact in this clubhouse. They were, they were great with me. They really tried to help me, you know, with some of the, the minor league guys and getting acclimated to, to the guys they knew, some of the prospects that they knew that were at, at that big league camp. Um, so, you know, it, it was more just getting to know people, get, getting to feel, I, I, you know, again, it wasn't, wasn't anything intense. Um, instructionally with, with anybody just kind of getting asking a lot of questions getting to know what how guys think about some things just um so i knew them a little bit better but but not much beyond that but but yeah chile and slayer really helpful i mean their their impact here will, will last a long time and, and even into the minor league guys that i was spending more of my time with they, they they took they went out of their way to make sure they were impacting those guys too thank you yeah <clears throat> your next question comes from mike puma Hey, Hugh. I'm just wondering what you see specifically when you look at Lindor right now. Yeah, uh, you know, I know, first of all, I, I talked to him last night for a little while, and, and the best news is he's he's still in a really good place mentally, that he's not panicking. So I think, number one, the the, the first thing to pay attention to is, is not panicking. Um, it, it still is really early in the year, and um, this is a guy that's always figured out how to hit, um, you know, he's trying to feel, feel some things out that have worked in the past and 
that probably will be the process again. I we're not we're not there yet. I haven't talked to him enough yet to, to dive into anything in particular. Um, he's probably trying to still figure out how to spell Qualamon for God's sakes. Um, but uh, we'll get to, we'll get there in time. But yeah, we'll we'll build off of what he's done really well in the past and and use some of you know, what, what it used to look like and compare it to now and see if he can pair up some of the thoughts that he that used to work for him in the past and, and see how that links up with what he's doing now. Also, so many of these guys were attached to Chile and, and Slate. I'm just wondering if, if you have to, uh, you feel like you have to win over some of them because of uh, the disappointment they have of losing those guys. Yeah, I think guys are, have been able to, compartmentalize that a little bit i mean that's kind of a separate issue and it's very normal and human that they have that empathy and and um you know some, some frustration with with losing guys that they really cared about that they were in the foxhole with and i think they've they've all gone out of the way to to you know make it clear that any frustrations they have have, have nothing to do with with me and they want to give they give me a fair shot and in my limited interactions with them in spring training they they you know we've gotten along so far so um, we just got to build off of that thank you your next question comes from ken davidoff hey hugh uh puma just asked my question so i will uh, i will pass and uh, wish you well thank you all right, next question goes to Tim Healy. Hi, Hugh. Uh, in the immediate term, what it will be different or what is maybe already different for Mets hitters in their preparation now compared to the last few weeks? Uh, I, I, I don't know. I, I don't know what, what exactly they were doing in the last few weeks. I. I only know the process that, that I'm familiar with. Um, I, I don't think it's going to be, you know, once we dive into it, I don't think it's going to be an extreme deviation. It's again, it's ultimately it's, it's pairing up some of the analytical information that, that we have on all our uh, you know, opposing arms and, and trying to really simplify it down to, to something that makes a lot of sense to them. So I, I probably may, may use some different language than, than they're used to. I don't think the, the process as a whole is going to be, you know, it's not like we're going to have more meetings or longer meetings or anything. It's just how, how we distill the information. And you mentioned early the importance of confidence for a hitter. When things are going poorly for a guy, how do you give him confidence? Yeah, yeah, you, yeah, you got the magic bullet right there. Um, <laughs> if we figure that out, we'll, you know, if there was an easy way to do it all the time, we'll, we, we'll, be, get, we'll be rolling here quickly. But, um, I really, I'm honestly, I think it could just comes down to getting to know what's worked, worked well for them in the past. So I, I, I don't have a lot of verbal interaction with these guys, but I have watched a lot of video of when they were really good. I know some of the movements that have succeeded for them in, in the past and in the, at this level. Um, and, and it starts, it starts there. If, if you can get connect back to some things that, that are, that they're going to know, and then have a conversation like, a lot of times you show a video of a hot streak from 2018, like, oh yeah, I was, I was thinking about that a little bit more and then, and it connects. And, um, you know, if you can help them see some of those things, you know, as you're comparing those videos and, and whatnot, you, you can have an impact there. Thank you. Next question is from Howie Rose. Hi, Hugh. Um, how would you describe the process of, gaining the trust of players when you're coming in, albeit early, somewhat midstream. Um, they have a limited amount of background with you, but apart from all of the X's and O's, how do you go about building the trust of people whose trust you're gonna to need to gain in order to be effective? Yeah, I'd say a couple of things. They, you know, these guys have all had 400 different coaches in their lives. Um, so they've, they've spent a lot of time already, whether it's subconsciously or not, you know, intuitively figuring out the kind of coaches that, that connect with them. I think a lot of them generally, when guys come in too hot at this level and are trying to fix things immediately without really knowing anybody or knowing anything about you, um, that's, that's a way you can lose guys. So just getting to know them by asking a ton of questions and 
um, you know, learning how to speak in, in languages that, that make the most sense to, to these guys, that's, that's critical. I mean, we see it all the time at the minor league level and we're hiring new hitting guys. Um, a lot of are obviously, as you guys have seen, but a, a ton of hires in professional baseball from guys in the private realm. Um, you joke all the time about it. it's in the private world. Like you have the, you have the person who walks into your cage at hello. Um, you know, they paid to get there. They know they've heard something about you and they're in on anything you say um, from that, from that point forward. Whereas the pro level, I think most guys have, you know, have been screwed up by a coach at some point in their career or, um, you know, had something that didn't click that they walk into a cage, you lost them at hello. It's, it's a lot more skeptical, which I think is a healthy thing, really. I mean, most, I'm generally nervous if a guy doesn't walk in with a little bit of skepticism of what, what's this guy bringing to the table. So um, starts with asking a lot of questions and then I think it finishes with just showing them that you're, you're putting in every, every extra minute of your day to, to find out whatever the heck they need to find out that, that fuels the, the top of that pyramid with, with confidence when they step in the box. So. And, and you mentioned having known Walt Riniak, and he, if I remember right, he was considered somewhat unorthodox because he was preaching that top hand coming off the bat, you know, when most guys weren't. Did you pick up any of his unorthodoxy, or do you share any of uh, what might be considered somewhat offbeat philosophies that he might have had? Um, yeah, it's, 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 yeah, he was big, uh, one-hand finish. Um, all the, a lot of those Red Sox guys like Gedman and um, Dwight, that's who I grew up watching all those guys too. And I, I remember, um, I remember all the one hand finishes and, and when I worked with them, that was, that was a part of it. No, it's just another, another tool in your bag as a coach to, to know something that, that might work for a guy that, um, you know, the, the one hand finish can be a thing for guys that are cutting their swing off potentially with their top hand and, and letting, letting that top hand free a little bit opens up some things. They feel some things they haven't felt before. So, um, yeah. So yeah, I picked up a little bit from everybody and, and I guess that, that was a little unorthodox. So that, it, again, it's just another club in the bag, I, I would say. Hugh, thank you very much for your time this afternoon. You bet. Members of the media, please remain in the room for Jacob DeGrom.